doing this morning doing all right good <laughs> so um, we are currently doing our uh, sermon series called uh, Philemon and so last week we talked about forgiveness and how we should forgive people that have wronged us you know um, and how we should show that same kind of forgiveness that God showed us so but this one is gonna be just a it's going to focus more on fellowship. And so we're going to go ahead and dive into Philemon chapter 1, verses 12 through 25, where it says, I have sent him back to you in person, that is, sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion of but of your own free will. For perhaps he was for this reason, separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, Charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. Well, not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time, also prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you as do Mark and our, okay, you know what, I'm just going to call him A, and Demas, Luke, and my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So I want us to kind of just look right here at the word koinonia. So that's a Greek word that means simply fellowship. Now, Paul uses to refer to his relationship with Philemon. So this word fellowship also refers to the idea of a mutual partnership where people share in something together. But how this is used is just goes a little bit beyond that. This word goes beyond just a contractional partnership to describe a strong community. But this also explains the, as followers of Christ, we are equal and share the gift of God's grace. Onesimus is part of this koinonia and should be treated as such. See, koinonia means we share life together. We're family. Brings me to our first point. We should treat each other as family for we are equals because of Christ. We are equals because of Christ Jesus. We can look at Galatians 3, chapter 26, verse 29, where it says, But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. So what he's saying here is that we are all one with Christ. No one's better than the other. And we shouldn't treat each other differently. We should treat each other the same. And I love that he explains that we are that because we belong to Christ, 
that promise God made Abraham so many years ago, so many years ago, we are now living. We are now considered descendants of Abraham because of Jesus Christ. That's amazing. We are living out the promise God made Abraham. That's amazing. And I also want to go even further. It says Paul even tells Philemon to welcome Onesimus. Now, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, a dear brother. I think that's important. Why is that important? Because back then, so when he was supposed to show kindness to Onesimus, so what that's saying is, the social pecking order of Roman society was very harsh on runaway slaves. So if you, they had a runaway slave, if it was a fugitive, it was going to be subject to severe punishment. So slaves were property back then. To ask Philemon to forgive and accept Onesimus was to confront the social and economic order head on. Hmm. It brings me to point number two. We need to live and behave differently than the world. How we handle conflict should be different than how the world handles conflict. See, we are born into communities that influence how we live. Your family, your friends, your neighborhoods, they're all, they're all shaped and formed of who you are today. The community shapes us, and we reflect that upbringing. See, these communities will tell you how to treat others. I mean, it's all over, all social media, it's all over there. They'll tell you how to manage your money, how to become successful, how to find love. See, when we become part of God's community of God's family, he gives us new commands. See, he does it countercultural. See, the story of Philemon isn't just about forgiveness, but confronting ungodly cultural norms that Christians are part of and changing them. See, the world says, this is how you treat someone under your authority like a slave. It's all he deserves. But Jesus says to treat him as a dear brother. The world tells you that you have to lie and cheat to get ahead. But Jesus says the truth will set you free. Mm. I want to say the truth will set you free. And he's meaning him, Jesus, because he is the truth. He is the way and he is the life. He's the one that will set you free. The world tells you um, that you have to look out for yourself, but Jesus says to look out for the good of others. The world says to hold on to power at all costs and protect people who look like you. Jesus says to give your power away and to serve your neighbor, even if they're very different from you. When Philemon welcomed Onesimus as a brother, he showed the world how the Jesus community treats others who are different and yet siblings in Christ. See, we should treat people differently. When people come into this building, they should be treated with love and respect. We shouldn't treat them any different. Do you realize that people don't come to church because of church hurt? Do you realize there are churches that kick people out because of who they vote for? Do you understand that people will kick people out of churches because they made a mistake? Because they're not perfect. They don't fit their mold. But that's not, that's not how the church should be. The church should be a place where the broken and the hurting can come and be with Jesus and find life change, which is through him. 
it breaks my heart to see that there are people out there who are turning people away because of how they're living their lives. But if they can just see the real Jesus, the real Jesus who came onto this earth to die, have an authentic relationship, and they see that through how we treat them, as Jesus would. Someone walks into this, to this, to these, to this church, and we find out something about their past that we don't agree with. We should, we should be there for them. We should love them. We shouldn't turn a blind eye to them. We need to welcome them because this is where they need to be. Because think about it, did Jesus ever turn anyone away? Think about the woman at the well. She was a Samaritan. That was a, that was a big no-no, number one. Jews and Samaritans didn't get along at all. But here comes Jesus, goes to Jacob's well, knowing that, that this woman would be there. He sought her out. And he told her everything that she did, but didn't reject her like the community did. He could have. He could have, did, he could have done it the way society had done it to her, but he chose not to. He chose to do what? Show her grace. And we should do that too. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter how they vote. It doesn't matter what political party they are a part of. All of that, according I, to me, I think that's all nonsense. We should see it as Christ does. See, when Paul was talking in, um, with Galatians, how we're all the same in Christ Jesus, we're looking at them through the lens of Christ. I'm not saying that we should... How do I put this? I'm not saying that we should not do our duties in society, that you know, we, we shouldn't... You know, um, doesn't mean we shouldn't stop, you know, like being a man or a male or a female. Doesn't mean any of that. It means we should look at them through the lens of Christ. We should treat them as Christ would treat you. <laughs> I love how God wants to challenge us to love somebody as He would. Because my question for you today is why are we putting standards on people that we can't even live up to ourselves? Why are, we accept, why are we trying to expect perfection from other people when we can't even do it ourselves? There's only one man that was perfect, and that was Jesus. We cannot be perfect. It is impossible. So instead of shaming people, making them feel terrible about themselves, because I'm telling you what, they already do, they already feel that already. And they don't need that when they come here. They should, they should get the exact opposite. They should feel welcomed, loved, and appreciated. Because this is a place where it's safe where you can come as you are and you can be with God who will turn you away because of your sin no matter how messed up it is. Maybe you're thinking, mm, that ain't going to work for me. I'm too far gone. Mm -mm. It's never too late. It's never too late. He wants a relationship with you. And I think what happens is when it comes to perfection, it does affect our relationships because we think we have to live up to that standard and others should too, but it's impossible. Man, do you realize how we treat others? 
within the family of God impacts their connection to God? Our exclusion and mistreatment of people always reflects poorly on the community of Jesus. I have family members that don't come to church. Why? Church hurt. Because of how some church treated them. And then they have this wall that when they come into a new church, they're afraid it's going to happen again. And that's normal. I think we do that with pretty much everything. We want to protect ourselves. But I think we can do better. I know we can do better. So that leads me to point number three. No matter who you are in society, you need Jesus. So there was a guy named uh, Chuck uh, uh, Coulson who was convicted of obstruction of justice during the Watergate scandal that eventually led to the downfall of President Nixon. One of the greatest scandals in American political history marked a change in American values. It was recognized that even an American president could lie and cheat, but Coulson found Christ in prison. After he was released, he became a leading voice in evangelism, building bridges between Christians and ministering to thousands, including the incarcerated. Here's what he says. He says, my greatest humiliation is being sent to prison was the beginning of God's greatest use of my life. It is not what we do that matters, but what a sovereign God chooses to do through us. God doesn't want our success. He wants us. He doesn't demand our achievements. He demands our obedience. So I think one of the most important parts of this, of this hum- of humbling uh, that Colson experienced was the recognition that no matter who you are in society, you need Jesus. I, I don't care where you're at in society. I don't care if you're poor, rich. I don't care if you just got out of prison. I don't, I, wherever you're at in life, you need Jesus. I'm going to say it. President Biden needs Jesus. Amen. Our country needs Jesus. Amen. Russia needs Jesus. Amen. All these countries, all this stuff that's happening, they need Jesus. But how are they going to experience that? Through the church. We're supposed to be his hands and feet. We need to love them. We need to be kind and encouraging to each other and to others. Because believe it or not, when someone new comes in here, they're watching you. They're watching. They want to see how you treat each other. They want to see how you, han- how, how you handle things. And you know what's crazy? People expect a lot out of pastors, too. And you know what? They expect perfection out of them. And we can't. I'm, I'm just being honest. We are not perfect. You know what? I'm human just as you are. We serve the same God. We have the same Holy Spirit. And we're both covered by the blood. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean I'm better than you. We are all equals. Let's say, let's, let's just have a hypothetical thing. Let's say the President of the United States comes in here. Do we treat him any different than we would anyone else in this building? No. We treat him with love, respect, just as Christ did to you. Just as he did with the disciples. Because I remember I was at a church once where we had a political figure come in. Um, I think he was, uh, he was the governor. And another governor we had um, recently, um, I can't remember which governor it was. But anyway, we had a governor come to our church. And everyone treated him very differently. Very differently. Acting like he was some, you know, special person, right? Got special treatment, all of it. But see... I think we should treat them just as a normal human being. We should love them, be kind, 
and that's another thing I, I, I just, I think we need to tackle too, is like, when it comes to family, it's so easy to tear each other apart, right? They do something wrong and you just want to have at them, right? God wants us to build each other up. Scripture says we're supposed to do that daily, encourage one another daily. To be kind, to uplift. You know what I like about this church and what, and what I have found? Because I believe this is family. I've been treated like family here. When I was going through rough stuff with my father, when my dad passed away last year, it'll be a year, August 25th. This church helped. I was going through so much, trying to learn the ins and outs of ministry while also trying to deal with my dad, with my dad passing. And y'all were there. You guys help more than you realize, asking me how I'm doing, what's going on, like, you know, and, and I didn't feel alone. Or recently when I had to move, suddenly, just out of the blue. Oh, wait, you got to move out. I'm like, oh, okay. So the church helped. Because I believe the, the body, the church body helped just like Jesus would. Jesus was using his bride to help me. And that's how it should be. We should be willing to help other people. Okay, how can I help you today? Or if you see someone in need, help them. Or maybe someone's being dis just feels discouraged and life's rough. How about you give them an encouraging word? Maybe you know a scripture that would help them. Send that to them. You know, Tom does it to me um, a lot. <laughs> and I'm sure he's done that with, with you and, and other people. But what I love about the community of believers, the community of Christ, is when we treat each other like family, we're there for each other. We don't tear each other down. We encourage one another. And we're there for each other. See, we are there to carry each other's burdens. We're supposed to be there. When you're, when, you're in, when you're in the trenches, we're there with you too. When you're going through pain and suffering, we're in it with you. And when you're celebrating success or anything that happens that's good, we're going to celebrate with you. We're in this together. See, Jesus even prayed that his church would be one as him and God are one. He wants unity. See, Satan wants to divide. And he does it, and he knows what he's doing when it comes to division, too. You see it all, you see it in churches everywhere. But God wants us to be unified. How do we do that? Well, we can all agree on one thing. Jesus died and was resurrected, and we're here to share the good news. We can, we can all agree on that. Very, oh, yes, we can all agree on that. We are community, and we can love on people. Just think of how many people we can reach when we work together. Because we're in this. We're fellowshipping with one another. We're going to take communion together. Another example of quinonia. It's amazing. We're not supposed to do this life alone. We weren't designed to be alone. We're meant to be together. And maybe you're here today and you haven't found that community. Well, maybe it's here. Or maybe it's somewhere else. And if you're new here, we're glad you're here. I mean, we can't wait to get to know you. 
I love, I just love how Jesus does things. But it's also crazy how our human side gets in the way. Or if someone makes you mad, you just want to tell them off. But then you have that Holy Spirit telling you, nah, that's not the right way. I'll go this way. How about instead of telling them off, how about you say something nice? I believe that God wants us to do things together. What does God want you to do? Maybe there's someone that's on your heart, on your mind, that maybe you need to reach out to. Maybe you have a fellow believer that you know is going through it. Maybe you just need to pick up the phone and call them. Maybe there's a family member that maybe just gets on your nerves. Maybe you need to call them and ask them how they're doing. Maybe the reason they're acting out so much is because they're hurting. Hurt people hurt people. What does God want you to do? What does he want you to do in that situation? Paul was telling Philemon to welcome O as a brother, not a slave as a brother, and to treat him as such. How are we going to treat people when they walk in these doors? We're going to judge them, cast them out? No. We're going to welcome them. And let them know how much they're loved by God. And let them experience it for themselves. So I want the band to come up. And what I want us to do right now is as they're getting ready, I want you to ask God today, Lord, how can I be of service today? How can you use me to further your kingdom? Who needs to hear the gospel? And who can I help in the community of believers? Lord, show me. Because I'm telling you, when you ask God, how can I serve? Oh, he'll let you know. Maybe you'll get a text from somebody. Maybe someone will reach out you weren't expecting to. Oh, there you go. Who is that person God wants you to serve today? Mm -hmm.